that point. Great. Um, so I am a wildlife biologist for New Hampshire Fish and Game. I've been with the department for uh, hard to believe 23 years. Um, on that. Um, I've done a variety of different work for the department, but for the last 17 years, I have focused on habitat management specifically. Uh, I manage a large property for the department in Pittsburgh, so I spend a good chunk of my time in the woods up in Pittsburgh um, through that part of my job. But fortunately, from the very beginning of my career with New Hampshire Fish and Game, I had a strong interest in non-game and endangered species and started working with Martin essentially that first year that I was working for the department in 2000. Um, Martin were really an understudied species in the state at that point. And tonight I am gonna to take you through the story over the last 23 years of what we've done. All right, am I supposed to use the arrows for this or? They are not. Yep, I clicked on the screen and that worked. All right, so the first thing I think we need to cover because there's usually a lot of confusion about this, it's exactly what is a Martin. And I know I am supposed to be covering Martin and Fisher tonight. Um, I am very uh, biased towards Martin, obviously because of all the work that I've done in New Hampshire with Martin. So I will pull Fisher in where I can in this story tonight, but the bulk of the information is gonna be around Martin. So top corner over there on the, your left um, is a fisher. So fisher are one of the biggest uh, mustelids or weasels that we have here in New Hampshire. Uh, a big male fisher can get upwards of 15 to 20 pounds easily. Um, so when you think about a 15 to 20 pound animal, uh, especially with a big puffy fur coat in the wintertime, you can imagine that animal looks pretty big out in the woods. Our next biggest mustelid is his friend over to the right, and that is an otter, um, also part of the weasel family. Can get very similar in size, but obviously to tell the difference between the two, we're usually thinking about habitat. Um, otters are prone to be in aquatic habitats, usually in ponds and rivers and streams in the summertime. Uh, in the wintertime, you will see them doing watershed movements. So you'll actually find places most of the time where you see tracks out in the middle of the woods with that typical weasel pattern, the two by two. And then all of a sudden you'll see a slide where they've slid on their belly through the woods on the snow, um, which is the telltale sign for an, an otter um, out there in the woods. So then we come to the marten, which is kind of that animal that's right in the middle of the size of all these mustelids that we have here in New Hampshire. A large male marten usually gets no larger than two pounds here in New Hampshire. So they're quite small. Uh, a large female, no more than a pound and a half. Usually they're somewhere around a pound. So they're pretty small mustelids. But again, they have that big fuzzy fur coat in the winter time that makes them look a little bit bigger. To tell them apart from the other mustelids, they're probably the easiest mustelid to tell apart here in New Hampshire. They have this bright orange throat patch that actually gets to be like a chartreuse hunter orange in the summertime. And the rest of their body turns like a deep chocolate brown. And then in the winter time, their pelt kind of changes to the changes to this kind of tawny colored brown. And that throat patch gets a little bit lighter, but it still has that very distinct orange coloration to it, which plays into the story that I'm going to be telling later in the talk. The other telltale sign for Martin are those pointed fox-like ears. You'll notice with the other mustelids, they all have ears that are pretty flush and kind of rounded to their head, whereas that Martin has kind of big pointed ears compared to the size of his head. Makes them very cute. Um, so then moving down, we have the next mustelid, which is over here on the bottom right. Anybody know what that one is? Mink, exactly. So mink are a little bit smaller than Martin, typically around a pound. A big buck mink can be upwards of two pounds, but typically when we see them, they're, they're smaller in size than Martin. The best way to tell them apart, especially from their track, is mink have really small tracks compared to a marten. Marten has exceptionally large feet for its body size. So if you see a really tiny 
weasel track or weasel pattern in the woods, chances are it's either this guy, the mink, or the next one we'll talk about, which is the ermine. So the last species is actually two different species um, that we put into the same kind of ermine category, and that's the short-tailed weasel and the long-tailed weasel. Um, this species, these two species actually turn white in the wintertime and then turn back to that brown color in the summertime. Um, and it's another one that we often get calls about with people confused about uh, what they're seeing. Um, these guys love to be in your rock pile outside your house or anywhere, place where they can hide. If you have one near your house, I highly recommend them. They're really good at taking care of mouse populations um, in close proximity to people's houses. So, Martin distribution. Um, here in the Northeast, we're on the Southern edge of Martin distribution. Um, in Maine, they've been a long um, occupant of that landscape and never dropped to population levels that were low enough that warranted listing or closing the season. So they actually have an active trapping season in Northern Maine. Um, in New Hampshire, um, Martin were listed as a threatened species in 1973, which was the inception of the State Threatened and Endangered Species Act. Um, and they're now listed as a species of special concern. Um, in New York, they are not listed and they actually have an active trapping season, the Adirondacks for Martin as well. And then in Vermont, they're listed as a state endangered species still today. Um, and this was primarily due to the loss of numbers from overtrapping and habitat changes that have occurred over time. So like I said, I was gonna try and pull some fisher information in here. So fisher are distributed um, in a very similar pattern to Martin. So the Martin distribution is up on the right-hand side, fisher is on the left-hand side here. And as you can see, historically, they ranged much further south um, than Martin ever did, but their range is currently retracted significantly, specifically in many places out west, fisher are actually listed as a threatened or endangered species in many of those states. And a lot of that is associated with habitat, uh, Fisher are associated with mature or older forests out west, and there's a lot of cutting practices that have retracted a lot of that habitat out there. So they're in the process of trying to recover a lot of those populations. Here in the Northeast, Fisher are doing quite well. Um, we have had some population fluctuations over the last 20 years that we don't really know exactly what's driving those changes, but it's a healthy, robust population, and we have actually given fishing, fisher to other states to help do reintroductions um, from the fisher here in the Northeast. So a little bit of ecology uh, around Martin. Uh, a Martin home range for a male is somewhere around three square miles. So for a small little weasel like that, you can imagine how much movement and how much he has to eat to maintain that three square mile home range. A female is usually somewhere around a mile. And there's usually multiple males overlapping a female home range. Um, and it's just a breeding strategy to make sure that the, uh, all the females on the landscape are getting bred. They breed in mid to late summer, which is different from Fisher, which are breeding now. Um, and they have what's known as delayed implantation, which simply means that after that egg is fertilized, it doesn't implant on the uterine wall until February. So it actually stays with the animal until it gets the nutrition that it needs through the best time of the year. And that will determine whether or not the embry embryos will actually implant on the uterine wall or if the animal will reabsorb them. And that's why it's a species that's actually um, dependent on food sources. And you can see those food sources impacting changes in the population over time. The kids are born in April. Um, and usually Martin have their kit, kits up in a cavity in a tree. So they're dependent on big cavity trees to have those kits in. And then after four to six weeks, they'll actually move all those kits down to the forest floor. They'll make a den on the forest floor, finish raising and getting those kits kind of independent. And then they'll move out and be on their own. Dispersal usually happens in fall and early winter. 
Um, there's a lot of backfilling of habitat that happens at this time. As you can imagine, as animals are dispersing, they're trying to find home ranges and habitats for themselves. And they overlap with other animals. They get pushed further and further out into less de desirable habitat unless they happen upon habitat that's not occupied. Females often out compete older females. This was something that we um, actually saw in one of the research projects that we did that I'll talk about a little bit. And then this is something that I always like to point out to folks is that historically in our literature, um, we had densities of Martin somewhere around six Martin to one Fisher. Um, so naturally on our landscape in the appropriate habitat, Martin were more abundant, which makes sense. They're a smaller animal, um, have higher breeding potential, um, and more overlap than what Fisher do. Currently, we feel that that um, ratio is probably closer to two to one. Um, and there's some folks that are pretty concerned about Martin um, and their future based on some of the predictions that folks are making with climate change in their habitat. So Martin um, are dependent on complex forests. And what complex forests, forests provide is the structure for lots of different prey. This is essentially what it comes down to. So Martin, while they're considered uh, carnivore because they eat a lot of uh, different species, they'll also eat things like berries and vegetation during certain times of the year. Um, the primary food sources here in the Northeast are redback voles. Um, and we think that snowshoe hare actually make up a pretty large component of their diet as well. So where the story of Fisher and Martin really comes together is with snow. Um, like I mentioned before, Martin have exceptionally large feet for their body size, which gives them the ability to actually float on top of that deep fluffy snow and outcompete Fisher in that situation because Fisher have small feet for their body size and tend to punch through and slog through that deep snow. So when we have deep fluffy snow conditions, that is what allows Martin to actually persist and outcompete Fisher on our landscape. The more we have less snow, more shallow snow, hard snow, compact snow, that's when we start see start seeing Fisher actually push Martin out of certain habitats and kind of push them back from the places that they've historically been. A lot of modeling work has been done around this and we can actually predict that in places that receive more than 240 centimeters of snow per year, which is about 94 inches um, or 19 inches per month, that is when we tend to see Martin on our landscape. Does anybody know what the average snowfall is around here? I think it's a close one. Oh, yeah, and this has been a pretty low oh. season overall. So I can remember winters up in Pittsburgh getting 270 to 300 easily uh, inches of snow. Um, so yeah, we're definitely seeing those numbers decrease, but there's definitely places in the state that are still getting enough snow for Martin. Um, the other really Cool thing about Martin that allows them to outcompete Fisher on the landscape um, in these snowy conditions is they're actually subnivian hunters, which just means that they're hunting small mammals under the snow during those winter months. And that is where that complex forest comes back into play. So when you have lots of trees that have fallen over or branches that are low on the trees, that provides all those air pockets that the, the Martin are using to get down under the snow to hunt all those small mammals. Um, and again, the competition piece with Fisher plays into to all of these pieces. So naturally, because I'm a, a habitat manager, I like to talk about um, structure and how we manage habitats on our landscape. Um, so from the research that's primarily come out of Maine, we know that less than 25 of the landscape in non-forest cover is usually a good way to have no marten on your landscape. So when you think about places that have a lot of agricultural fields, um, even large water bodies, you tend to see Martin kind of drop off those landscapes pretty significantly. Um, less than 30 to 40% of the landscape in an early successional or young forest stage. So Martin like that structure. They like mature forests, they like lots of trees and like the forest to be connected. 
They like to be able to move within that forest in their home range. So when we see lots of young trees within a home range, that's again, when we start seeing Martin populations dropping off. Um, when we talk about how to maintain Martin on a landscape, what we'd like to see is within a 26,000 acre block, at least seven Martin home ranges that you can put together in that block. So it's just playing a game of percentages and figuring out how much young forest you can have versus old forest to maintain Martin on your landscape. So then when you drill down a little bit smaller into a, a tighter area, what we consider a stand, which is simply just an area of the forest that's been classified with the same characteristics. Um, Martin like to have 30 to 50% canopy closure, which again is just an indication of whether or not those treetops are touching. Um, they do spend some time in the forest canopy hunting, um, resting, so that canopy connection and that canopy is really important for those reasons. 14 to 18 meters squared or uh, 60 to 80 square feet of basal area. So basal area is simply a measurement of how big your tree is. Um, and you add all of those, those, those diameters up and it's the amount of area that's covering a certain area within your stand. So when you get into the 60 or 80 square feet, they prefer closer to 100. It simply means that you have plenty of big trees. Uh, in that forest. Trees greater than nine meters tall or 30 feet tall, again, just an indicator of mature forest, retaining snags greater than 18 inches, obviously for their cavity um, needs, and then promoting that dead and down um, so that they have access under the snow in the wintertime. So systematic research, this is when um, my Participation with Martin kind of started coming into play. When I was hired in 2000, I quickly realized that the department had no information essentially on Martin, even though they had been listed since 1973. So I proposed a wide, um, a broad scale trapping effort to figure out where we had Martin um, in the areas in Northern uh, New Hampshire where, where sightings had been reported throughout the previous 20 year period. Um, so at 177 different locations with 354 traps, I had two traps at each location. Um, I actually captured 34 different Martin um, during that effort. I then took some GIS data, which in 20 years has come a long way. <laughs> so this is extremely crude compared to some of the stuff that's being done now with GIS. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially I just took the mixed and softwood habitat, overlaid it with snow, then fragmentation and our fissure densities to figure out where we were most likely to have Martin on the landscape. And the resulting map looked like this from the data I collected. So high elevation came out as being exceptionally important, which we already knew was pretty much the case. Um, but this really showed exactly where those places were that were super key to Martin. And then once we took more of the data and put it into that same model, we could actually predict the places that were kind of the secondary habitat or the places that had potential to hold Martin. So um, anything that was yellow or above towards the blue, so yellow, green, light blue to blue, was the areas that were most likely to have Martin in the state. Um, even to this day, we have little, very little data for Southwest New Hampshire, um, but from all of our models, it does show that there is potential for Martin down that part of the state. So moving forward to 2010, um, there was a very large wind development project that was being proposed in the core of Coas County, right through the heart of Martin Habitat. Um, and this threw up several red flags for a fishing game. And we actually filed as interveners in that project because we felt it was gonna have a significant impact on Martin Habitat, as well as Bicknell's thrush habitat here in New Hampshire. Unfortunately, from uh, that litigation, the project was approved and it was moved forward with, but we were provided a mitigation package to do some research work with Martin and Bicknell's. Um, and this uh, part of the presentation is about some of the work that was done 
um, as part of that installation. So the objectives of the study uh, was to compare the biology of New Hampshire Martin to other populations. So we really wanted to see what was going on um, with New Hampshire compared to Maine and New York specifically. We wanted to tease apart the impacts of the wind farm uh, and the Martin's use of that high elevation habitat. And then we were also really curious about the best way to monitor Martin into the future, because we knew that uh, Martin seemed to be changing and the population was increasing and we didn't really know why. So the results from that study, we actually captured 34 different Martin on the top of one single mountain, which was far more than I ever expected. I thought we would probably max out somewhere around 15. So this was again, about a 26 to 30,000 acre landscape that we were on. Um, and it was very clear that it was a saturated habitat um, being used very heavily by Martin. The other really interesting piece to that was the sex ratio. Usually you see a sex ratio that's two to one, even three to one. Um, and as you can see here, it was a one to one ratio, which was an interesting um, piece to this picture. Um, <clears throat> like I said, the high elevation habitat was extremely important is what this really uh, drove home for us. But the other piece that really interested us was the 17 mortalities that were documented over the three year period where we were monitoring the Martin. This was exceptionally high mortality. They had never documented mortality this high in other studies that had been done. Um, and we actually were able to attribute, I think it's the next slide, most of that mortality to Fisher, Coyote, and Red Fox. Um, one of the pieces that we never even considered in the installation when we were talking about the impacts to the wildlife was the compacted surfaces that were being created by putting roads to the tops of the mountain. And then every day having a groomer or something driving to the tops of those mountains to check on the turbines. Um, and then the actual space of the trees being cleared, the wind sweeping through those areas and actually causing that snow to be compacted in part. Essentially what this did is it gave all these species that typically are excluded from these high elevation habitats, so fisher, red fox, and coyote, all are typically on low elevation habitats in the wintertime because they can't be in those deep snow places. This gave them access to those places and it caused that competition and overlap with Martin on that mountain. And we think that's where a lot of that mortality was caused. Um, some of the other um, results from that was we did see some shifts in habitat use from the Martin um, based on the development and the different phases of the development. But the other thing that this uh, research really drove home for us was this really cool seasonal movement pattern that Martin had throughout the year. So as soon as the snow fell and started accumulated, accumulating on the landscape, um, Martin would go up to these high elevation habitats and persist in really dense populations in high elevations. And then as the snow pack went away and other species had access to those habitats as well, and Martin had more access to other places because I think things were getting more spread out, they actually moved down slope into those forests again in lower elevation habitat. So it was almost like this pulsing that would happen based on the season um, and the amount of snow that was on the landscape. So the last piece to that project was the monitoring tool. And uh, the researcher that we had working on this project, his name is Alex A. Sarin, um, and this was his master's work. Uh, and he could have probably written three PhDs out of the amount of data that he collected um, in this project. Um, so this piece, he actually added um, a lot of this work. We weren't expecting him to take it to the extent that he did, but he essentially did a whole different research project where he covered the landscape with remote trail cameras and developed a technique for mark recapture of Martin based on their throat patch. So he identified individual Martin by the shape of the throat patch, and then he could pick up when a Martin was picked up by all the different cameras on the mountain. And mark recapture is a way that is used to actually get a hard density estimate for a population. 
And so this was a novel technique that had never been used for Martin um, and really was kind of on the leading edge of this type of work in, in North America. So here's an example of a throat patch picture. And this was the same individual caught at two different cameras. So again, he was developing methods that not only could differentiate between individuals, but the little white blocks on the bottom were actually measured certain size so that when a Martin's foot was up next to it, he could measure how big the foot was and actually classify it as a male or a female based on the size of the foot. Um, and again, this provides a density estimate and gave us some um, metric that we could use in the future to go back, remeasure, and see if there was changes over time. The resulting de density estimate that he came up with for this project was even more interesting. Um, this mountain, again, we knew was really important, but it actually had the highest densities that had been recorded in the Northeast. Um, so it was 0.52 Martin per kilometer squared. Um, and the only other place that had anything higher was uh, 0.62 kilometer, uh, Martin per kilometer squared. And that's actually up in Baxter in the uncut portion of, of Baxter. So moving forward again, we're now in 2017. <laughs> um, time flies when you're having fun. Um, but after the completion of our wildlife action plan in 2015, we go through a revision of our threatened endangered species list. So it's on a 10 year rotation. Um, and on that rotation in 2017, Martin were on the top of the list for evaluation for being taken off the um, threatened species list. So part of that process is a whole kind of step or framework that's used for all species that are on the list. Um, the Wildlife Action Plan team is the first place, then it goes to expert review, there's draft proposals, public hearings, a final draft, and then it was finally accepted in the spring of 2017. So I'll go through kind of the justification that we used for that. So here are the metrics that we use for species that are on the threatened endangered species list. We're evaluating habitat, whether there's any harvest issues, disease and predation issues for the species, and then if there's any other things that we need to be thinking about. So for Martin, um, we're in really good shape habitat-wise. Um, so the areas shown in that kind of brownish tan color are actually conserved lands here in New Hampshire. And then they, the stuff that's showing up in the back that's that black or gray color is actually the predicted Martin habitat in New Hampshire. So as you can see, the White Mountain National Forest really does a great job of encompassing a lot of that habitat, but we do still have some gaps kind of in the core of Coas County, places that could still be conserved. Um, some of the threats that still exist for Martin uh, is timber harvesting. So when you have a landscape greater than that 15% in young forest, which some of you might know is definitely um, something that can happen in Coas County with the ownership patterns that we still have up there um, is definitely something that we're thinking about. Salvage cutting from insect outbreaks. We've had a lot of balsam woolly adelgid on our fur in Coas County, which has caused a lot of cutting of softwood specifically. Uh, and then of course, spruce budworm, which is actually an insect that attacks fur, not spruce. Um, we've been seeing increases in those populations. And for anybody that remembers the outbreak back in the 80s, um, this is kind of the cycle that happens naturally with this insect, and it tends to knock back our softwood um, to younger forest condition, which is definitely something we're thinking about. Uh, large development projects. So um, Northern Pass is no longer uh, an issue, but at the time, um, one of the big things with Northern Pass was that they were looking to upgrade the Coas Loop. If they upgrade the Coas Loop, which is actually in process now, it allows for more capacity for wind development in Coas County. Um, there's already a proposal, I think, that's going to be waiting in the wings as soon as that, that capacity comes online in Coas County. 
Uh, there's a landowner that has put up multiple met towers for measuring wind and owns several of the ridges that are left for conservation in Coas County. So there could be another push for wind development um, in Coas. Climate change and snow is obviously a huge um, concern for us and thinking about ways that we can mitigate that. Um, and then the loss of spruce fir in general due to harvesting. So uh, this gets us back into Fisher territory a little bit. Um, just thinking about, so Martin are actually occasionally incidentally caught um, during our Fisher trapping season. So being that they overlap in habitat, they overlap a bit in size, um, there's no way to prevent necessarily Martin from getting into fisher traps. So with that increasing fisher population um, and decreasing, increasing Martin population and decreasing fisher population, um, we were seeing incidental captures of Martin on our landscape. It actually was one of the first data sets that we had for Martin in the state. So the first graph here on the bottom is simply showing the number of incidentals that we had. Um, and the thing I like to point out to folks on this is the fact that we never had more than five females taken on the landscape um, at any point in time. Your females are your breeding portion of the population and that's where your population growth is in that female population. So minimal impacts to the Martin population from the incidental take. Um, over the years, our fisher trapping has declined significantly. Um, prices for fur have declined. Um, there's less people getting into trapping, um, and it's just uh, the effort has declined significantly over time. Um, the other thing I like to point out on this slide is we collected a bunch of age data on all the Martin that were incidentally caught. Um, and this is the distribution that you would want to see in a healthy population. So uh, the majority of the animals that were taken were young of the year or just a year old, and that curve goes down and um, gets really low as you get further out in age. Um, Martin can get into their teens, um, and the oldest Martin I think we picked up for many of the incidentals was seven years old. So our occurrence records, I've been tracking Martin occurrence from um, not only staff collecting track locations or sightings, but also from the general public. I add all that data into a database and kind of tracked it over the last 23 years. And as you can see, it has progressively filled out um, into a variety of habitats in New Hampshire to the point where we feel like we're, we're kind of pushing three quarters of the potential habitat that they have in the state is actually occupied, which was a big indicator for us for taking them off the list. Um, disease and predation. So again, this gets back to that relationship with Fisher. And the thing I like to put, point out on this um, is we actually saw the blue line is the Fisher take over time. Um, and as you can see, that declined kind of progressively over time and then really like went down to zero. But the thing to pay attention to is as that Fisher population was declining, our Martin population was increasing. So we were seeing more take of Martin, which was an indication that that Martin population was likely increasing, Fisher was decreasing. And again, the competition between the two species, I have to wonder if whatever was happening to the Fisher population causing that decline actually gave Martin the opportunity to take off and do better and to recover in New Hampshire. I'll never know the answer to that. <laughs> uh, Fisher, we continue to struggle to collect enough data on Fisher. Um, we have remote trail cameras that we've had out for seven plus years, and we're starting to get a better handle on it, but without trapper data and good solid trapper data, we just don't have good indices of how to track those fur bear populations to know what's going on. So again, for all those reasons, we chose to remove Martin from the threatened species list. We didn't feel there was a need to keep them at that status. 
but we still left them on our species of special concern list, which gives them gives us the opportunity to kind of continue to track them over time. We know there's long-term predictions that they're going to decline, but it seems like they're doing well in New Hampshire and we couldn't justify keeping them on the list for that reason. Um, I like this picture. So I never thought I would get a nuisance call on Martin until I received this picture. Um, he was raiding the bread box in the ski shack on the top of the Balsam Ski Resort when it was still open. Um, and it always cracks me up because the guys that uh, used the ski shack didn't know that it was a state threatened species at the time. They trapped it, they moved him two miles, and two days later he was right back in the bread box. Okay. So we're closing in on um, the end of the pre presentation and kind of the final pieces. Um, so this is my primer on wildlife habitat man or wildlife population management. Um, so for any species that we're managing in the state, we're thinking about habitat because habitat really is what's driving where anything is in the state. And when we look at habitat, we narrow that down to distribution. So within that habitat, where are animals distributed? That's what we're trying to figure out. Like how many, um, and then from distribution, we're thinking about abundance. Um, so the easiest piece to collect is distribution when we think about just occurrences on the landscape. You can document that easily. Abundance is a different animal. It's really difficult to come up with a solid estimate of density for any wildlife population. To do a full census, just like it is with people, it's really difficult, right? Some people don't respond to census information. Some people get missed in census information and it's the same deal with wildlife. So typically what we use for managing wildlife populations is what I refer to as an index. So instead of having an actual population estimate of an exact number of animals, we're just tracking over time whether a population is increasing, decreasing, or staying stable. And so my next question in this whole kind of journey that I went on with Martin was, do we need density information? Should we be looking at density information? Is that the final piece for making this decision to delist? So, because I like working with Martin, <laughs> um, I said, what the heck? Let's try and take Alex's methodology that he did on Mount Kelsey for figuring out the density of Martin on that single mountain and see if we could expand that methodology to the entire state of New Hampshire. So for this effort, we chose one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven different blocks or landscapes where we were going to sample with a certain intensity of camera traps on the landscape using the same method of taking a picture of the throat patch, identifying individuals, and then doing a mark recapture study to get those density estimates. So these are a couple of examples of the animals that we but through this effort, uh, we had a team of researchers at the University of Massachusetts Amherst that were leading up the project. We collected all the field, field, field data and sent it all down to UMass Amherst. There was a team of 17 undergrads sorting through photos and a graduate student that kind of compiled all the data and did the final analysis. Um, I think my favorite is the monster. Um, if anybody is a monster energy drink drinker, <laughs> um, I thought that was pretty clever when they came up with that one. So from that effort, um, we collected just shy of 200,000 photos. Um, of those, about 47,000 of them were of Martin alone. And from those 47,000 photos, they were actually able to uh, identify 116 individuals um, in the population. So if you can imagine trying to keep track of 116 different <laughs> animals digitally, it was a pretty impressive effort. The resulting density estimate map 
and information looks like this. So our statewide abundance, we did this work over two different seasons that had two very different mast years, which simply means it had two different, very different food source years. So if you recall, uh, that can have a big impact on Martin populations. So the first year was a really poor year. Second year was like a banner mast year. Um, so our population estimates were much higher the second year than it was the first. Average densities were higher the second year than the first. Um, and the interesting component was the densities that were resulting were definitely lower than the densities that were predicted by Alex A. Sarin um, at the same location. I think I have a slide for that that shows that. Um, the other really interesting piece to this was the White Mountain National Forest had the highest densities by far with 1.0 Martin per kilometer squared, which again, if you recall, blew any of the other density estimates out of the water from other places in the Northeast. So really shows the importance of the White Mountain National Forest is that source population for a lot of Martin. And this was the slide I was talking about. So Alex A's original study had 0.25 uh, 0.52 Martin kilometer squared, and this estimate came up with 0.3. Um, and this was the concerning piece to me. Um, with that much difference between those two estimates, I felt like it was too much uh, difference to be able to use this as a tool that could be really used to track Martin populations at the accuracy that we needed. Um, to make predictions from it. Um, I think it's really interesting and it gives us a good benchmarks to work from, but I think the result of all this work is gonna tell us that we need to just focus on a few individual locations for tracking Martin densities over time and using that really refined, honed in estimate as what we do to track Martin. In the, in the state instead of trying to do the whole state um, in this kind of effort. Um, the other component of this, as I mentioned a little bit before, is we're actually testing um, the use of remote trail cameras to track fur bearers in general. We've had, had over 200 cameras deployed between May, uh, New Hampshire and Vermont for the past seven years. Uh, we've been using that to track lynx population, which is part of the work that I talked about the last time I was here. Um, but it all applies to Martin as well, Martin and Fisher. So the map on the right here is showing what's called an occupancy map, which is the map that's produced from all of those cameras. It's not density work, but it's just tracking how occupancy or that distribution potential changes over time versus the density map, which is the one on the left. Um, and what that would look like over time. So again, this is just teasing apart what we wanna use moving into the future to Martin to monitor these populations. Um, this is just an example of a table I was thinking about for creating benchmarks for Martin and when we should either delist them totally, whether they needed to be relisted. Um, and that's the thought process that we're using for these types of species. Um, at fishing game. So population goals and objectives. Uh, we're thinking about when would Martin be removed from that special concern list? What would warrant relisting? And if we should ever consider a season, when we think about the dynamics between Martin and Fisher and the potential impacts that we can have on those two different populations, I think it's not a tool that we just need to keep in the toolbox. And again, as camera trapping the answer. I think we're going to find that it is. Um, for a lot of the species that we have on our landscape, it's going to be the easiest way to kind of track population indices over time. And that is it. Yeah. I'll leave that up because it's a cute uh, picture. <laughs> Uh, I just have two questions. One is, uh, you know, one of the slides, or several of the slides, you talked about uh, 
aging the mark of our, our young, their uh, yep. oldest mark um, that has been captured for several years old. Uh, and how, uh, how are you using Yeah. Mark? Um, so to age a Martin, uh, you have to pull a tooth, uh, and it's the premolar that's right behind the canine that we usually pull for those purposes. And just like with a tree, when you cut it down, when you pull a tooth and you slice off the very bottom of that tooth and look at it under a microscope, it actually has rings on it that tells the age of the, the animal. So I'm not the one doing the aging. <laughs> I pull the tooth and I send it to a lab out in the Midwest and they do the aging for me. Ah, great question. So um, anybody that knows me and knows my truck knows that it smells like skunk. <laughs> um, so with any fur bear essentially, or a lot of wildlife work, um, when you put skunk scent out, it draws everything in. And it's purely probably a curiosity thing. Um, I mean, we see everything from moose being drawn to the sites where we have cameras to all the different fur bears, and it's really that that skunk smell that kind of pulls them in. Yeah. Who has issues from like standing up like in the adventure of your imperial ancestors? How old were they compared to the wolves and wolverines or what? I think there's a lot of competition. Exactly, with other species like wolverines and things like that. But I think it's that deep, fluffy snow. So I know in a lot of those places, like in Alaska, they tend to have really um, dry conditions. So when they do get snow, that snow is like light and fluffy, and fisher just don't deal with those conditions well at all. They can't get around in it. Yep. Where is the biggest fisher population in the process? Oh, that's a really excellent question. If I had to guess, I would say Southwest New Hampshire. Yeah, I think the whites, because you have so much of it in high elevation, really prevents them from being in there. Um, and I think further north, again, because of the conditions with the snow and the longer winters, I think Fisher probably do much better down that Southwest corner. Uh, looks like the life expectancy I think Fisher is probably similar, maybe a little bit less than a Martin. So I would say probably max is 10 years, somewhere in that. Um, I don't think they really know in the wild exactly how long a lot of these animals are living. It's mostly captivity based uh, ages that they, they work off of that. Yeah. Uh, so we did have telemetry callers on the Martin uh, for Alexei's work uh, that he was doing up there. And we actually had towers uh, or antennas that were collecting location data consistently, constantly uh, on those collared animals. So yeah, they, there's many studies uh, that they do that with Fisher as well. Yep, sure. Um, I had a question about um, how you look at the recreational use uh, land in our country, uh, you know, snowmobiling being tight in light of these impacts, um, with impacted, um, you know, with the roads and snowboarding. Yeah, it's a great question. <laughs> um, unfortunately, no. Um, as you all, I'm sure, are aware, like recreation in Coahuas County is a huge thing, and we have uh, a large complex network of snow machine trails in the wintertime um, and now ATV trails in the summertime and the impacts on wildlife, I think we really don't have a handle on. Um, I think from a population standpoint, a lot of our wildlife populations are doing fine, but when you really drill down and look at individual impacts, that's probably where you would find some of that impact coming into play. Uh, on the management decision of the management 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 of the management
that information and it's used in tracking populations and um, fur bears, I don't think we're managing at the level where we could impact densities in that way. So I feel like to mitigate any kind of conflict or interaction between people and different fur bears like bobcats, it's the same deal. You know, bobcats getting into chicken coops and um, at people's bird feeders and things like that. Um, it's more about getting people to live with wildlife and um, to mitigate impacts between these species because they're drawing them in um, and they're creating that food source and those animals are just doing what they do. They're, uh, they're out there on the landscape. So we need to learn to live with them and figure out like the best way to co-occupy essentially our landscapes. So many people have been here yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I wish we could tap into it more. Um, so there's a project called Snapshot USA that was kind of initiated out of the Midwest where they actually created a site to crowdsource camera trap data and it was hugely successful. Um, and I've been kind of beating this drum in the fishing game with remote trail cameras because I really think it's the future of how we're gonna end up managing a lot of our species here in the state. Uh, and it's just taken a little while to get people on board. So I think eventually we're gonna get to the point where we're gonna be collecting more of that data from, from folks because I really do think it's gonna end up being. Yeah, so unfortunately we don't have a way to use it or a framework right now, but I'm hopeful that we're gonna go in that direction. Yeah, it's true. That's just a mean question. <laughs> um, I think I would probably pick Martin because Martin to me, um, are more solidly grounded in our landscape. I think links are a really important part of our landscape, but um, I don't think we'll ever see the densities and the population that we have like we do for Martin. Um, and I and just the foundation of all the work that I've done over the last 23 years really stems back to Martin. So the work that I did with links started with Martin. So. No, I think we're getting a lot of overflow from Maine. Um, the Maine population is doing really well. And I think that's the result of the spruce budworm epidemic back in the 80s, put them in this perfect, perfect situation to have really high snowshoe hair densities for a window of time. And now that uh, habitat is raining, it's all developing into bigger softwood habitat. And so lynx populations are actually starting to like retract and, and move on the landscape because of those changes. So I'm not convinced that unless there's some kind of big habitat changes that lynx are gonna stay on our landscape. Um, I think we're kind of in a pulse surge of lynx here right now. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for not just the work that you were doing, but for taking the time to be here and, and share this. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat>